Hi, I'm Jonathan Edwards, and I want to welcome you to the Jed Breaks Bread podcast. My goal in this podcast is to teach the truth of the Word of God and apply it to our lives that our orthopraxy might be as good as our orthodoxy. May you be blessed. Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today, I want to use this time to elaborate a little bit more on a point that I made in my sermon this past week. And if you want to find that sermon, you can go to youtube.com and you can type in uh, The Legacy of Moses. That's the sermon title. Or you can go to our church's YouTube page. Uh, It's Grace Brethren Chapel. You'll be able to find the sermon there, or you could find it on our website. There's a link there, uh, www.gbchapel.org. You can find the sermon there. In this past week's sermon, one of the points that I made, actually the second point about uh, the legacy of the life of Moses is this, that um, despite being a faithful person, despite, in Moses' case, a very faithful servant of Yahweh, there are times when our personal sin affects consequences that will last uh, for many, many years or for a long time. Uh, Perhaps they don't come about right away. Like in the case of Moses, the consequence didn't happen right away, even though God told him as soon as he had struck the rock, that uh, he would not be able to enter into the promised land. It was still a a while before that consequence of sin became a reality. One of the connections that I made on Sunday is that if you are experiencing trials in your life, then you should, as one of the questions that you ask, you should say, Lord, are you causing this to come about? because of some sin that I've committed? See, that is a reasonable question that ought to be asked, and that is one of the questions that should roll through your mind as you have uh, occasion to experience various trials in life. See, I think um, one of the mistakes that many Christians make, one of the mistakes that I've made uh, before, is thinking that all trials— are basically the result of some external circumstance that's been brought into your life. Now, we would acknowledge that trials are a result of the natural consequences of living in a sin-cursed world. We know this to be true because of what God spoke to Adam in Genesis chapter 3, that the ground would bring forth thorns and thistles, and that it would be difficult for him to earn his daily bread, his daily keep. So when we experience trials, a lot of times those trials come about because of just the natural consequence of living in a sin-cursed world. And as Americans, we, uh, American Christians in particular, we have programmed ourselves to rightly look at James chapter 1 as the means for dealing with trials. We are to consider them all joy. We are to understand that trials have a greater purpose, that the purpose of trials is our sanctification, and that we should grow in Christlikeness and endurance and faith and so forth and so on as a result of trials. But that is looking to adopt that view. That is a good view. Of trials, but it's an incomplete view of trials because there's another aspect to why you might be experiencing trials. And it could be that it's not a result of, let's say, the sin cursed world or the natural consequences of sin. You could be experiencing trials as a specific result of some sin that God is trying to get you to repent of. All right. And I think that this category of trials is often overlooked by believers, and that's one of the reasons why I I emphasized it in my sermon this past week. I emphasized it because it was true in the life of Moses, who was a great and faithful servant of God. And if it's true in the life of a man like Moses, then it's certainly going to be true in our lives. 
And I wanted to elaborate on this point a little bit. I didn't have time in my message to do so. So that's why I like the podcast, because I can uh, take maybe a point that I wanted to elaborate on, but didn't have time, and I can elaborate it on, on it in the pod. So let me turn to one of the critical passages in the New Testament that deals with God's discipline. It's Hebrews chapter 12, okay? Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. The author of Hebrews is chastising the readers. He's chastising them because they have not strongly resisted in their striving against sin. In other words, these are believers who know that sin is wrong, and they are tolerating sin in their lives. They're just allowing it to to be a part of their lives. And here's what the author of Hebrews says to them. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Verse 5, you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Now, I take it that the Christians who were being written to here in the book of Hebrews were committing a specific type of sin, and they knew that they were committing this specific type of sin. It was something that was ongoing, and they had either refused to confront it in their midst, or they had refused to really deal with it in a strong way. And the author of Hebrews, uh, if you read the rest of the context of the book, is writing to this group of Christians who is experiencing suffering. And he brings uh, their suffering into focus as not just the natural consequences of living in a sin-cursed world, but he brings their suffering into focus as this is the specific discipline of the Lord because you have not worked hard enough to overcome this specific sin. You're tolerating this sin. It's been brought to your attention. You're continuing to tolerate it. And so now, because you're tolerating the sin, you are experiencing the discipline of the Lord. Now, verse 7 is really important, okay? It gives an important connection for us. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons— For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? The important connection made in verse 7 is this. You will endure through the discipline, and you you will survive it. You will overcome it, because God is dealing with you as with a son. All right? I have two sons, and I love my sons very much. But when my sons sin, I need to bring discipline to bear upon them. And the purpose of that is to connect the negative consequence of sin or the negative action of sin with a negative consequence in life. Does that make sense? When a person sins, when your child in particular sins, then you need to expose them to a negative consequence so that they understand sin brings pain. Sin brings suffering. Sin brings hurt. And that's exactly what God was doing to this group of Christians that the author of Hebrews was writing to. There was a a well-known sin that they were committing. It was being tolerated by the community, and they were suffering as a result of the sin. And the author of Hebrews makes this very important point. God is disciplining you. He wants you to repent from the sin so that something worse doesn't happen to you. That's why he's disciplining you right now. He wants you to repent from the sin and to turn away from it. Now, the author of Hebrew makes a very important point. If if we as earthly fathers discipline our children so that they will grow up to be positive, contributing members of society— How much more, then, should the earthly father discipline us who are going to become citizens of heaven one day? Here's what the author of Hebrews says in verse 10, all right? And I'm going to go back to verse 8 and 9, but just verse 10. 
they disciplined us, that is, earthly fathers disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. And, and here's the thing. When, when you discipline your child, when I discipline my child, I want him to act in a way that is consistent with the Word of God. And in the same way, when God disciplines me as a believer, he wants me to be conformed to his holiness. All right? That's the whole point. And, and we ought to welcome God's discipline. We ought to welcome God's rebuke and God's reproof. Why? Why? Because we are, in our pride, short-sighted as to our true shortfalls. Does that make sense? Because of our pride as human beings, because of the indwelling pride that we have, we are short-sighted to see our true weaknesses and sins, and God, he is able to see those, and he will bring the appropriate discipline into our life to help refine us so that we are holy, like God is holy. This is why I think, personally, that humility is the greatest virtue that we ought to be seeking to cultivate in our personal lives as Christians. The prideful person will not receive the discipline of the Lord. The prideful person will um, make excuses for the discipline of the Lord. The prideful person will look to some other source or to some other cause for the for the sufferings that they're experiencing. The prideful person will will never acknowledge that, wow, I'm I'm suffering under the hand of God's discipline because God wants me to be refined. I'm suffering so that I can be more holy. No, we need to, instead of being prideful, cultivate an attitude of humility so that when we do suffer, when we do experience difficulties in life, when trials come, one of the first questions that we ask ourselves is, could this be the discipline of the Lord? That's a very legitimate question to ask, and it, it's absolutely one of the questions that you ought to ask if you're a believer and you're suffering today. Could this be the discipline of the Lord? Look at what the author of Hebrews says is the result of discipline. Verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Wow. I understand discipline is not joyful. I know when I discipline my children, they're not very happy at that particular moment. They're not joyful. But I can see the fruit of consistent discipline in the life of my children to where my oldest, uh, who's nine years old right now, is doing a rather consistent job of being mostly obedient, mostly thoughtful in her words and her speech. And it leads to a peaceful life for her. She doesn't, she's not kicking against the goads. She's not trying to be rebellious. She's trying to do the best that she can to honor her mother and father. And that results in a great deal of peace for her. Now, the toddler phase is different. When you have a two or a three-year-old who is trying to push all the buttons and understand what the limits of life are, they will have as much limitations as you give them. And a toddler needs to understand that they are a person under authority. And that, that will last for their entire life because we are all under authority for our entire lives. So parents, we have a responsibility to discipline our, especially toddlers, on a very consistent and regular basis so that, why? They can grow up to understand, respect authority, live under authority, to be a peaceable person, this is good for them. It's proper for them. And in the same way that you do that for your child because you love your child, God does that for you because he loves you. You are a son of God. You are a child of God. 
Now, what if you're saying, well, I don't know that I've ever experienced the discipline of the Lord. Well, the author of Hebrews has something to say about that. Verse 8, if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. That's quite the statement. If you're listening to this and you're saying, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't know that I've ever experienced the discipline of the Lord, you really need to do some soul searching. Because the author of Hebrews suggests here that if you have never received discipline from God, then you might not even be a true son of God. You see, I discipline my sons because they're mine. I don't discipline somebody else's sons because they're not mine. I discipline my own children. I don't discipline other children. All right? That's the particular and peculiar and special role of a mother and father to their own children to practice discipline upon their own children. So if you're listening to this and you think, well, I don't know that I've ever been disciplined by the Lord, there's two possibilities. One is that you are not a legitimate child of God, or two, if you are a legitimate child of God, that you have not considered that the suffering and the trial in your life might be the result of God's discipline. And it might be God trying to get you to change certain sinful behaviors. Those are the two options. Either you're not a child of God, or you have stubbornly refuse to see the trials as God's discipline to try to get you to change something about your life, in particular, a sin that you continue to partake in and do not repent and confess. Now, I recognize that that may sound a little bit harsh, that may be a little bit bold, but that's what the Word of God says. And uh, it's not my fault that the conversation amongst evangelical Christianity for many years has not been to look to self to see what sins you're committing that have brought about your suffering. Rather, the conversation has primarily centered on, okay, uh, it's this person over here, or it's this situation over here, or it's, it's something external to you. That's really where the conversation is focused. And that's, that's wrong. That's an absolutely wrong way to look at it. Now, In saying all this, I'm not trying to suggest that every time you suffer or every time that you experience bad things in your life, I'm not trying to say that that is God's discipline upon you. What I am saying is that that should be one of the first questions that you ask the Lord in prayer. So let's say that some bad circumstance comes upon you, some suffering. In your prayer time, you should be saying, Lord, I recognize that you're sovereign. I recognize that you've brought this situation into my life. Heavenly Father, I don't understand exactly why you've done this, but let me humble myself and and ask you some questions, Lord, and please reveal to me whether these things may be true or not. And then you would say, Lord, perhaps this is Uh, been brought into my life because you want me to grow in a certain area like patience or gentleness or kindness. Perhaps that's what you want me to do. Lord, perhaps you've brought this into my life so that I can repent of a sin that I have been committing and I should not uh, be committing that sin. Lord, perhaps you've brought this into my life for a combination of those things. You see, if we're really going to if we're really going to find God's purpose in our suffering, we have to be willing to consider all the alternatives. We have to put all the options on the table. And a lot of Christians aren't willing to put all the options on the table. They want it to be any option other than my own personal sin. But that's not consistent with the Word of God, and that's um, 
In fact, if you're if you're going to do that, if you're going to take that option off the table, then as the author of Hebrews suggests, you may not even be a legitimate child of God if you're not willing to look at that. In support of this truth taught in Hebrews, I want to turn your attention to James chapter 5. This is also a pretty well-known passage, but um, it's well-known for being controversial rather than well-known for being like one of those beloved passages that people turn to for comfort. Here in James chapter 5, James is writing to the church and he's basically saying, look, is anybody amongst you suffering? Let him pray. Is anybody cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anybody sick? Okay, sick, suffering. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So here we have the prescription, the allowance that is given for the sick believer to call for the elders of the church that they might pray over that person, all right, and anoint them with oil. And there's a possibility that they may be raised up from their illness, but there's a possibility that they won't. Okay. Now, one of the really interesting things about this passage is you're sick to the point of not being able to move. Like, you can't go to the elders of the church. You're so ill that the elders have to come to you. All right, now, modern medicine has changed that a little bit because people can be very sick and still move around and do things like that. But in ancient times, it was a lot different. You know, if you were really ill, if you had a fever, very high fever, it was, it was not, you were not getting out and going anywhere. So you had to call for the elders to come to you. Now, here's what the text says in verse 15. The prayer of faith. So this is the prayer that is offered by the elders. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Notice the connection made in the text. You know, you think, well, yeah, the prayer of faith is able to raise somebody up so that they're not ill anymore, and the Lord is going to receive the glory. But look what's connected to it in the text. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. I think there's an underlying presupposition. The assumption of James is that this person who is sick is experiencing the discipline of the Lord. And he has committed sins. And it's because he has committed sins that he is sick. Now, this may not always be true 100% of the time, but James says it's a possibility that everybody should consider. It's certainly within the realm of reason to believe that somebody is sick because they've committed sins and they're experiencing the discipline of the Lord. You see, it's interesting that they call for the elders of the church. Why not call for, you know, the deacons whose responsibility it is to care for the needs of the body? I think that the reason that you call for the elders is that it's the responsibility of the elders to try to help the sick individual determine what has put them in that situation. And the elders are to have the wisdom to say, have you sinned? Is there some sin in your life that the Lord might be trying to get your attention about? Perhaps there isn't one. Perhaps there is. You see, and so the elders are called, not because they're men of such greater faith than the deacons, but the elders are called so that they can investigate with the spiritual knowledge and wisdom that they've been given, or let me say gifted with, by the Holy Spirit to determine and understand what's really at the root of the issue. This argument is strengthened by the next sentence that James writes in verse 16. He says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Wow. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed? James doesn't pull any punches here. He's saying, look, you are experiencing sickness because you 
you've not confessed. You have unconfessed sin in your life. And I think James's prescription for the church is something that would terrify most Americans in Wednesday night prayer service. That is, confess your sins to one another. Could you imagine that? I'm in prayer meeting and I'm confessing, Lord, you know, I ask that you would forgive me for looking lustfully at some other woman this week. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me for my unbridled anger that I expressed towards my wife or my children. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me for, and you fill in the blank, for stealing, for lying, for whatever. You know, confess your sins to one another. That hardly ever happens at our prayer meetings. But here, James says this is one of the important things that believers ought to be doing that we might not experience physical illness. Let that sink in for a moment. The New Testament writers, James and the author of Hebrews, were much quicker to view sufferings and sickness as a result of God's discipline than they were to view it as the natural consequences of living in a sin-cursed world. Why is that? Well, I think that they understood that God, because he is our Father, And because God is holy and he wants us to be holy, God is going to use external circumstances like suffering, like trials, to refine us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's really what we need to consider as believers in 21st century America. Are we allowing the trials to refine us into Jesus Christ? How does it refine us? Well, first of all, you have to say, am I sinning? Is this, a, is this a consequence for sin? I need to repent from that, from my sin, so that I can become more like Jesus. It's not always the case that you suffer because of sin, but it should always be the case that you legitimately ask the question, am I suffering? because of some sin that I am persisting in in my life. And God, in his infinite wisdom, in his grace, in his mercy, he reveals those things to us as time goes on. And I think God is also extraordinarily gracious in that he doesn't give us the worst consequence that we might ever be able to receive. Now, sometimes we receive very bad consequences for our sins. But sometimes we sin in very grievous ways on a repeated basis, and God still doesn't give us the worst consequence that we could possibly have. And we know that the worst consequence is ultimately death, right? Ultimately being taken away or taken out of this earth. And if you're a Christian and God decides to take you out of this earth, where are you going to go? You're going to go to heaven, but there will be a loss of rewards. There'll be a loss of opportunity to serve God here and now. That's what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. They were true believers. But because of their sin, and because of how grievous it was, and how public it was, God determined that the consequence for their sin, the discipline that they should receive, was death. And it happened immediately. We should be thankful that God doesn't generally do that for us. But what's the whole purpose, or how how should we apply this to our lives? I think we should apply it to our lives in this sense. When we are going through difficult times, when we have sufferings and trials, we should be the first person to ask God, is this as a result of sin in my life? We should ask that question first. A second thing is maybe you do wind up in the hospital, or maybe you wind up with some other physical ailment. If your pastor comes up to you and says, do you think this is a result of God's discipline in your life? Don't become offended at your pastor. He's just doing what James says to do. He's doing what the author of Hebrews says you should be doing. 
and you should consider that God sent him there to ask you these questions so that you can be refined and that you can be more holy like Jesus is holy. We certainly, certainly don't want to face the discipline of the Lord. And fear of the Lord's discipline should be a strong motivator for us to not sin. However, the flesh is weak, temptation is real, lust is real, the power of the sin-cursed world is great, even though we have been set free from both the power of sin and the penalty of sin, namely eternal condemnation. We still live in the presence of sin and in the presence of many sinners. And so it's reasonable to expect that we would struggle with sin in our lives and that God, because he is a loving father, would discipline us when our sin reaches a certain level or a certain degree. Ultimately, what should this do for us? Ultimately, this should cause us to want to be more faithful, more careful, and to cultivate an attitude of humility because a humble person is going to confess and repent quickly. But a prideful person will have to experience more drastic measures of discipline. So cultivate humility and rebuke pride. And again, I will say one of my favorite resources to do this is the little book written by Stuart Scott entitled From Pride to Humility. You can find it on Amazon for five bucks. Just go get it. Go get it and read that book um, multiple times. Keep it with you. Read it once a year so that you can continually be made aware of the manifestations of pride and how to put them off and the expressions of humility and how to put those on. That's your responsibility as a believer to imitate Jesus Christ. And he certainly, certainly was a man who was extraordinarily humble. I hope that this message has challenged you from the Word of God. And, you know, if you like this teaching, uh, if you appreciate this style that is exegetical, I would encourage you, if you're in the Northwest Ohio area, to check out our church, the Grace Brethren Chapel. You can find us online, uh, www.gbchapel.org. And presently, we're having Sunday morning services at 10 a.m., or I'm sorry, 10.30 a.m., and uh, we'd love to have you stop by. God bless. Keep serving Christ.